So hello everybody, welcome to this episode of Activist Lawyer, uh, Nove- the end of November, hmm. and we are joined today, I'm delighted to be joined by Kevin Hanratty, Director of the Human Rights Consortium, thanks Kevin. Thanks for having me Sarah. Not at all. We've been in touch a little bit Kevin, um, just back and forth about some of the work that you guys have been doing and I know last year we were really lucky that one of our podcast episodes featured in the Northern Ireland Human Rights Festival which um, very timely is coming up very soon so we'll talk a little bit about that um, but really really appreciative of you giving up your time and to discuss the really really important um, work that you and your organisation and your members are doing at the moment but firstly just by way of background if you would mind giving us a little bit of an introduction about yourself and um, just before we move on to the organisation. Yeah, no problem at all. And thanks very much for having me. Not at all. Um, I suppose by way of background, um, I'm from, I'm actually literally only from up, up the road in Drummond Tee, just outside Newry here. Um, went to school in St Paul's in Bestwick out Perfect. the road as well. Yeah. Studied history and politics uh, at Queen's um, and then after that, did a, a postgraduate certificate in education in Coleraine and his teaching history. I suppose like a lot of people trying to discover and search for what I wanted to do um, after university. And then uh, quite randomly, I suppose, got offered a, an internship with Seamus Mallon at Stormont's oh, okay. um, back in 2001 for the, that summer. And really from that point on, uh, I, I sort of started, took a bit of a tangent and worked in, in politics for about four years. Mm-hmm. I worked for the SDLP as a research and, and policy officer um, for various MLAs in, in the town here, John Fee, the late John Fee uh, and Dominic uh-huh. Bradley. And then um, in 2006, again, when the sort of another random change of, of, of direction, I was out doing um, some consultancy work for the National Democratic Institute in Macedonia that was working with sort of smaller political parties trying to um, look at their internal structures Mm -hmm. in terms of how they conduct themselves around elections. There was a campaign going on around uh, how the election, if trying to focus around free and fair elections, lack of intimidation, making sure voter legitimacy was was a priority for all the political parties out there. I was out there for about three or four months um, and then a job with this current organisation, the Human Rights Consortium, came up at a sort of entry level position as a campaign officer. Okay. Um, and I suppose having worked for the SDLP and working, worked in, in the consultancy role as well, um, I suppose it wasn't a term at, at the time, but the idea of social justice or issues around human rights were quite interesting to me. So uh, I applied for the role um, and was appointed, I think, in September 2006. And really, the, this was the rest of the history. I've been sort of working yeah. my way with the consortium for the last 16 odd years, um, wow. working up through the ranks. And I'm, I suppose I'm now director. I had a, I had a bit of a, I suppose a career break in 2011 and I went to work for the OSCE in Bosnia okay. as a human rights officer doing sort of human rights observation work in the in the city of Bandi Luka, which is in the northern part of Bosnia. So, yeah, that's my sort of... Uh, so it was random career trajectory <laughs> which has led me to, to here today. Random but makes sense, funny enough. And um, yeah, I, lo- I love to hear the different journeys that our, our guests have been on um, towards their career. So absolutely. And then with the Human Rights Consortium, well, obviously, you know, your fundamental, your, your work would be based in, in human rights. And we'll get a little bit um, into more of the detail of that. But just about the organisation itself, what kind of setup is it? Yeah, we're, we're a relatively small staff team. Mm-hmm. There are three full-time staff, and one part-time staff member based in, in our office in Belfast. Um, but we have a large membership. So the, the, the idea of the consortium, it, it is a coalition. Mm. So we have 165 member organisations drawn from across Northern Ireland. And I suppose our membership really spans the whole sort of spectrum of civil society organisations that you would expect in Northern Ireland across both communities, across all geographic locations. And varying in size in terms of um, uh, numbers, um, outreach, but also, I suppose, um, size of organisation and funding. Um, So spanning from larger trade unions and bigger human rights organisations like Amnesty International Mm -hmm. and CAJ, right down to small grassroots community groups. I suppose the unifying factor in the consortium really is that the the members are shining up because they see a vision of of Northern Ireland as being a more human rights compliant uh, society. And they want to see advancement in terms of not just the the legislation that we have in terms of human rights, but actually the practical outworkings Mm -hmm. of that and individuals able to access those rights practically on the ground. Okay, so you joined the organisation in 2006 and I know you said you had uh, had a small break there, but between you joining and now, you know, has the core areas of the work changed somewhat? And I guess the types of work 
that you're focusing on really much depends and evolves with the political climate at the time. It's probably an obvious statement. Yeah, but <laughs> absolutely. And, and, and I suppose, obviously, it goes without saying that the, the political climate in Northern Ireland in that period has been completely up and down sure. in terms of um, our own governance, but mm-hmm. also in terms of what the UK have been, UK government have been doing. I suppose our, the long-running campaign and the sort of core of our work in the Human Rights Consortium is the, the, the uh, long-standing campaign to get a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. Okay. So the Good Friday Agreement in the Rights, Safeguards and Equality of Opportunity section of that agreement stated that you know, there were a couple of core commitments by the UK government that they would incorporate into domestic law the European Convention on, on Human Rights, and they did that through the Human Rights Act, and I know we'll, we'll probably come on to that later. Yeah. But the other um, key commitment was uh, to build on those convention rights draw on international experience and evidence and then add additional rights for Northern Ireland in, in, a, okay. in a specific Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. So that's, that's our core campaign. There have been, I suppose, various uh, processes and steps along the way. Um, there have been elements of political opposition from some parties here and some different formulations of the UK government. We're in a really interesting place now where we actually have majority political support for a Bill of Rights for the first time in a long time. Um, okay, what fol- does that look like well, I suppose for this part of the world? What happened following the new decade, new approach, uh-huh. um, was there was a commitment to uh, look at the content of a Bill of Rights and look mm-hmm. at the creation right. of a Bill of Rights. We felt at the time that it should have went much further. It should have made a direct commitment to have a Bill of Rights. It should have mm-hmm. com- committed to ensuring that that Bill of Rights reflected local circumstances and international standards that the UK are signed up to. But it was it was a fairly limited uh, s- set of, um, r- I suppose, rules for how that committee was going to operate. But it started work in earnest back in, uh, I think, March of 2020, mm-hmm. following the restoration of the Assembly. Um, but what we saw, I think, particularly during the, the COVID lockdown um, and the influx of civil society organisations who were willing to give evidence to that committee, mm. we saw a very strong focus on hi- evidencing and highlighting the clear gaps that, that exist in, in terms of human rights standards in Northern Ireland. So we're, in terms of civil and political rights, we're quite well protected uh, in the North at the minute, at mm-hmm. least, uh, under the Human Rights Act. But the big gaps uh, span the sort of international standards that cover things like uh, uh, social and economic rights around housing, poverty, food, Mm -hmm. um, education, right into sort of gender issues, CEDAW, the protection of women, gender-based issues, um, race, uh, the protection of persons with disabilities, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and the whole sort of spectrum of additional rights that haven't been incorporated into, into local law. So I think the the evidence base was was quite overwhelming for yeah. for for politicians who sat on that committee, um, and what we had, and this is sort of the tail end of of last year, twenty twenty one, coming into early twenty twenty two, we still had opposition from the DUP, but we had sort of turned a corner with some of the other parties, and okay. we now had the Alliance, Ulster Unionist Party, SDLP, Sinn Féin, all signed up to not only the concept of a Bill of Rights but a Bill of Rights that was more in line with some of those progressive standards drawn from, 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 the, from the UN principles that, that, that the UK had signed up to, but not necessarily incorporated, incorporated into domestic law. Mm. So that is a real, um, a real um, important point that we've reached, despite mm-hmm. it taking almost 22 years to get there. Yeah. And we should have had a Bill of Rights a long time ago. Sure. But this is important, uh, an important point. Uh, the, the real difficulty that we face now is that the UK government mm. are refusing to move on this on, unless they get com- political consensus. So they want all five main political parties to be signed up to this. Okay. Currently, that's not possible. But our view is that, you know, um, this effectively is happening one party a veto over progress on human rights in Northern Ireland, which is unacceptable, um, and they should be going with the majority. And I suppose linked to that is the important fact that there's a uh, there's a consistent uh, majority of people in Northern Ireland from across both I communities that suppo- have, have, have not only supported this yeah. this this idea now, but historically going back 10, 15, 20 years. So the, the polling, we conducted polling with Queen's, the mm-hmm. University, funded by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust in 2021, And again, when you ask questions about additional rights around health, around education, around food, around uh, housing, upwards of 80 plus percent of people across both communities are supportive of the concept of of incorporating those type of rights into into a Bill of Rights. And I think particularly in the back of COVID, we saw rights around health and around education being particularly important for people. 
Um, and I think those statistics were, 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 were particularly high in the sort of high high eighties, low nineties percentage wise. So there's 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 a there's a, an outstanding uh, commitment there in terms of the Good Friday Agreement, but there's an overwhelming evidence base for this to be there to is. this to be delivered. So that campaign has has formed the I suppose the core of our work over the last mm-hmm. twenty two years. But unfortunately, uh, in terms of uh, going back to your original question about the, the trajectory and the political context, unfortunately, what we've seen is that we've also had to um, start to do a lot of work around fighting regression in rights in terms of the mm-hmm. standards that we thought were brought into Northern Ireland or into the UK that we thought we could depend upon, but were are, are now sort of gradually being eroded, certainly by the current UK government. I suppose that goes back to a period in 2012 where there was uh, efforts to um, by the by the Conservative and Lib Dem coalition to look at the Human Rights Act mm-hmm. and to see how they could reform or shift that. Uh, at, at those at that stage, it was around conversations about writing a UK constitution because obviously there's an unwritten yeah. constitution in the UK. But for many people, that was a proxy for how do we undermine or remove or remove the Human Rights Act. There was a revisiting of that concept mm-hmm. in 2016, and now in the last year, last two years, um, the UK government are really going for it they in terms of trying yeah. to destroy the we, Human Rights yeah. Act. Absolutely, how frustrating is that? <laughs> I mean, to just work so hard and to have the support and the evidence base there um, for this change, and not even as you said to change, but it's to retain. And, and ensure retention of rights and fundamental, you know, rights that we already have. Um, a lot of those connected to the European Convention on Human Rights. So, just before we spoke, we mentioned Mr. Rab, and we know that um, this is one of his. This is his baby, I think, and he's going to go full throttle uh, with this. What can be done in terms of your campaign? What more can I mean? Is this a matter that you just as Northern Ireland is working on, or does this affect obviously the other devolved um, governments too? I mean, there must be more kickback than yeah. It, uh, no, it affects it affects everyone across the UK. It's mm. it's an the, the Human Rights Act is unusual, and it is the one sort of um, piece of hum, the one major piece of human rights mm. uh, legislation that applies across the UK. Um, so. Uh, it was a commitment not just in the Good Friday Agreement, but it was a broader commitment as part of the devolution settlement in 1997-1998 mm-hmm. to incorporate the Convention rights via the Human Rights Act. And importantly, it, it I suppose first of all in the context of the Good Friday Agreement, going back to that old phrase that was you know very prevalent in the 1990s, that idea of confidence-building measures. The, the rights uh, elements of the Good Friday Agreement were really important in terms of that idea of confidence building in the new institutions to guarantee people who were taking up, I suppose, power you know, ma- in a mandatory coalition that power couldn't be abused, that vetoes or, 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 or the exercise of power could not be exercised uh, uh, you know, to, to the detriment of one community over sure. another. Um, so those system of, of, of safeguards, of accountability, of, of confidence building measures were really, really important. And, and core to that was the, was the European Convention in the form of, of the Human Rights Act, which was um, uh, written into law in 1988 and came into effect in 2000. One of the things that it did was it bound the Northern Ireland Assembly that all this, the Assembly and the ministers had to act compatibly with mm-hmm. the Convention rights. Um, that was massively important, and, and again, that idea of, of building confidence, but not just at a political level, at a community level as well. That um, I suppose the trajectory leading up to that point in time, right from the convention being adopted in 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 in, in, in 1948, was that um, if you uh, felt there was a breach of your convention rights, clearly of, you had to up until 2000 take your case mm-hmm. through to Strasbourg, which was quite a lengthy and a costly uh, procedure. Yeah. And it wasn't everybody that could do that. Um, obviously, Northern Ireland's history in terms of the court is is is, is quite long-standing in terms of some of the uh, Article Two and Three cases that were taken uh, to Strasbourg, which really set the bar for Article Two and Three interpretation by the court. But that it wasn't every case was capable of go, going that far, being funded to go that far. Um, so the idea behind the convention was really to bring rights home um, and make them accessible to people, make public authorities accountable for be acting compatibly with the rights. Mm-hmm. And what we're seeing clearly at the minute is instead of taking rights home, it's clearly booting them out or yeah. just setting a fire under them, really, because all of those that progress in the last 22 years to make public authorities accountable for the performance on the convention rights is going to be 
quite frankly eroded yeah. and chucked in a bin sure. by some of the uh, measures that have been suggested in the, the well the UK government are framing it as a as a, as a UK bill of rights yeah. we've we've dubbed it the rights removal bill because that's mm-hmm. essentially what it is it will take many of those hard won rights and mm-hmm. sort of and scrap them yeah, and just in terms of, I know this isn't important, you know, regardless, they're going to go ahead with it, it seems. But um, the ideology behind it, is it Brexit driven? Do you think, I know this was a pre-Brexit notion, um, you know, you, you mentioned 2012 there, the Theresa May's government were pushing this forward. But do we think that that is spurring it on to have this complete disconnect from the convention? I mean, we've seen the convention completely torn to shreds over the last few months, um, in particular with this cabinet, so... Yeah, I think there's there certainly seems to be a backlash against the idea of any sort of outside interference mm-hmm. and you know what what they would dub interference we would call accountability. <laughs> um, so I think there's a there's an ideological opposition to the idea of sort of third party accountability, certainly mm-hmm. at an international or regional level. So yeah, the the, the ideological opposition to um, the EU and the Council of Europe have almost been intermingled. The two are separate Just entities. Um, yeah. But uh, I think the the taking back control sort of mantra has really sure. um, it filtered into other aspects of human rights. So the Council of Europe, obviously, in terms of the convention, the UK, yeah. ironically, were one of the key architects exactly. of that bill. Um, yeah. You know, d- developed in the aftermath of the Second World War to to hopefully prevent against the the mass violation of mm-hmm. human rights on, on a global and on, on sort of European scale to now flash forward to a situation where they're not only tearing that convention up but they're openly criti- crit- critiquing it critiquing yeah. judges and lawyers and attacking them for exactly. using uh, the very things that are upholding the rule of law in this country and uh, uh, upholding human rights so it's a really worrying situation mm-hmm. in terms of where we're at it really is and just staying on that point i, I guess with brexit i, I suppose um we're up here and we're out um, of the EU. Um, our neighbours, Ireland, are in the EU. We have, you know, our unique little position in the world here: Irish citizens, British, British Irish, or both, whatever you might be. How do you see? You know, it's almost like a two-tier system, is it? Or maybe that's the wrong way to describe it because I know they're both two juris- different jurisdictions. But it seems that you know, Irish citizens and, and people in the Republic of Ireland, not just Irish citizens, but, you know, have this whole extra body of rights to rely on that will potentially be eroded and already have that process has started here. I mean, that seems to me... It, yeah, well, I, I think the referendum, OK, it took everybody completely by surprise. Mm-hmm. Um, but for organisations like ourselves, I think that we, we were... We were, all, we were immediately on the back foot in terms of trying to catch up yeah. around uh, what the risk to rights were. So we've we spent quite a bit of time trying to analyse the sort of I suppose the scope of of, mm-hmm. of EU law and how it filters across human rights protections. And mm-hmm. you know, uh, we always say that if in 1998 the um, the the EU membership didn't exist, if there wasn't the single market there, if there wasn't open border if the um, rights and standards that existed as, as part of our membership of the EU weren't in existence, that we would have had to fundamentally alter what the Good Friday Agreement looked like because mm-hmm. the Good Friday Agreement was written on the basis of us being, uh, on the assumption, I suppose, of us all being e- part of an EU member state. So that idea of freedom of movement, about the, the, the idea of the underpinning of EU regulations and directives, Cutting across huge swathes of uh, you know overlap with, with with human rights, particularly this non-discrimination provisions that have been so important here, uh, and right through the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, I, I think the what we've seen in this sort of interim six years and the negotiation of the withdrawal agreement has been that. Our, our, our human rights landscape has, has, has shifted fundamentally. Mm-hmm. We used to have an assembly that was bound to act compatibly with EU law. That's no longer mm-hmm. the case. Um, we used to have the Charter of Fundamental Rights. That's no longer the case. We used to be able to um, say that when a directive in the EU was updated, it would be updated in, yeah. in law here. We no longer have that. Now, we do have an, a, a very many organisations like ourselves sort of uh, advocate and campaign for specific measures in Northern Ireland to protect uh, some of at least some of the human rights provisions that were guaranteed in the Good Friday Agreement and had overlap with, with EU protections. That was achieved to some degree with uh, Article 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which basically stated that there should be no diminution of human yeah. rights in Northern Ireland as a result of, of, of Brexit. 
Um, we also had a, a dedicated mechanism unit set up um, in the Equality Commission and in the Northern Human Rights Commission to monitor and evaluate uh, whether that, that, that is operating or whether those principles are being upheld. Now, on paper, that looks like a, a good set of provisions. Um, it's an asymmetric set of provisions. It only applies to Northern Ireland, so colleagues in the UK, unfortunately, don't benefit from those protections. But unfortunately, what we've seen in the interim sort of year, year and a half since those uh, measures came into, uh, into effect is that the UK, in many respects, have just fundamentally ignored them. Yeah. Um, we've had pieces of legislation like the Nationality and Borders Bill, like the Elections Bill, which have undermined and, and, and ignored those those mm-hmm. provisions, particularly for for p- people who are, have non settled status. Um, we have um, we have uh, actions like the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which you know on the yeah. face on face value look like they're only dealing with trade and regulation issues on the Irish border, but potentially undermine the Europe the role of the European Court uh, or European Court of Justice in supervising uh, the Article 2 powers. And in Article 2, there's also a provision, um, there's Annex 1, which lists four or five equality Mm -hmm. directives uh, around non-discrimination that are are historically brought over from the EU. But the UK have made a commitment to um, uphold and uh, update if the EU update them as well. If we don't have the appro- a proper supervision of the European Court of Justice over those measures, then the, 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 the context and the applicability of those directives will change in Northern Ireland from the way in which they apply in yeah. the EU. So there, there are all sorts of measures that the UK government to gradually either ignore or chip away or undermine those powers already. Mm-hmm. Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, uh, those other pieces of legislation that I mentioned, and and generally it paints up a picture that the you know the rule of law, in terms of, at least in terms of human rights, has little value currently for this government, um, and that just then is reflected in some of the other actions around the Human Rights Act, um, yeah. and we also have you know additional sort of piece of legislation like the Legacy Bill, which is currently being fast tracked to through Westminster, um, and will drive a coach and horse through any of the legacy investigations or the plans of the Stormont House Agreement plans Gosh, around legacy yeah. investigations. And that, again, is fundamental to our understanding of how Article 2 and 3 of the Convention work. You know, there is supposed to be proper uh, independent scrutiny and investigation yeah. of Article 2 and 3 cases. That will not be possible under the provisions of the Legacy Bill. Yeah. So it, it, it paints a very worrying picture in terms of the direction of travel of where we're going in terms of human rights, certainly under yeah. this on, under this current government. And but it, obviously, um, this has been the case for the last twelve years, at least in terms of the, the gradual um, erosion of those protections. Yeah, I mean, one of my questions is going to be to outline the cha- you know the important challenges, but I don't think you can pinpoint it um, down to any particular area. There, this is seismic in terms of the impact that this would have. And am I right in saying, with the erosion of you know these mechanisms and you know the ability to uphold the rule of law and to scrutinise and oversee you know our cur- how things are currently managed, does this go back to Parliament? Then, I mean, does that give? Part, Westminster more control in terms of uh, scrutiny. Or, you know, how does it work then if we're um, limiting, you know, the mechanisms that we currently use or that we have been accustomed to? Yeah, well, I suppose there there, there are various ways in which um, Parliament are already involved in terms of scrutinising mm-hmm. legislation for human rights compliance. Um, they're supposed to give, a, I suppose, a, an Article 19 um, declaration at mm-hmm. the start of each um piece of legislation to say that it's compatible with human rights. They're now saying they're not going to introduce that. Or, or c- so how continue. does it? <laughs> well, they, uh, they, they, I think, uh, to be fair, what they, what they actually want to do is see Parliament being more involved in some of this human rights uh, scrutiny. Okay. But for me, um, it, 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 that, is, that is a code word for um, potentially mm. preventing any progression. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, we, have, we currently have um, a system whereby courts here can uh, say that a piece of legislation is not compatible mm-hmm. with the ECHR sort of declaration of incompatibility. Yeah. Um, but there, under under cer- a certain clause of the HRA, there's an interpretive obligation um, o- on the courts to, uh, I suppose, automatically, if possible, interpret most legislation 
as being compatible with, with the Human Rights Act. The government are saying that uh, they're going to remove that interpretive obligation. So that would leave, I suppose, the legal landscape in terms of whether thousands of pieces of legislation are compatible with the convention rights up, you know, up in the air. Yeah. And it will also mean that it's the likelihood of more declarations of incompatibility will increase, mm-hmm. and therefore they will have to return to to the Parliament, uh, to the Westminster Parliament, if that legislation needs to be changed to be compatible with convention rights or to make it compatible with convention rights. The likelihood of Parliament under this current government wanting to change that's legislation yeah, to be compatible with convention rights isn't no. high. No. So I think that's that's a, that's w- worry. a worrying problem. Absolutely. There are also m- moves to erode the uh, compliance and the obligation on public authorities to uh, act mm-hmm. compatibly with the Human Rights Act. And that's another way in which these, these measures are being, are being eroded. I suppose um, going back, you know, the 22-year history of, of, of the Human Rights Act, mm-hmm. it's actually the compliance by public authorities and their sort of positive obligations to act compatibly with the Convention that has seen the most progress in terms okay. of human rights. Because while we while we hear about the sort of the landmark cases and the key judgments coming out of courts here in the UK, mm-hmm. it's actually that soft advocacy power in terms of uh, civil society organisations mm-hmm. and grassroots groups being able to say, listen, sure. you know, there's a right here um, to private and family life and your actions Absolutely. either in a care home or in whatever setting it is are not compatible with that. And, uh, you know... Uh, and not in every case, obviously, but in a lot of cases, that sort of soft advocacy and lobbying power and using the Human Rights Act as a tool has been very effective. So, again, the measures are, that the, this government are, are proposing to introduce would sort of cut the feet out from sure. under that sort of obligation of public authorities to either ignore that that obligation or, or to change it. And really, that will diminish the power of the, of the of our access to, to the convention rights. So, yeah, sorry. Linked to that, there's, a, there's another um, really worrying development whereby uh, Section 2 of the Human Rights Act places a duty in domestic courts to have regard to the jurisprudence of the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights mm-hmm. in Strasbourg. And that was really important because it ensures a degree of, uh, they don't have to slavishly follow, but no. it ensures a degree of, of compatibility between what course, courts are yeah. saying here and what's happening in Strasbourg. And in turn, that's important because it meant that, you know, you didn't necessarily have to go to Strasbourg as the sort of ultimate arbiter of rights to to secure a a vindication for a violation of rights. If if this measure is introduced and that that linkage is broken mm-hmm. um, and the UK government are determined to bring it back to a sort of black letter sort of reading yeah. of what the what the the text yeah. says, uh, not as a living instrument that develops over time, but what it meant then and what it d- directly means, then that will fundamentally alter how the convention applies. It will limit its interpretation. It will limit people's access to a broader uh, the living instrument document yeah. of, uh, idea of the of the convention. And in turn, um, will mean that there's more likelihood of the UK being in violation of of, of, of what Strasbourg say or at odds with what Strasbourg say. So that is going to be Huge. if this goes yeah. through, that's going to be the next fight. Absolutely. So they're they're going to put people in a collision court domestically, mm-hmm. not to be able to use access to convention rights domestically which will force them to go to Strasbourg and then mm-hmm. that will be the next fight with Strasbourg where they will be complaining, no doubt complaining that these foreign judges are yeah. telling us what to do. Which, well, it's because they've denied access to convention rights at a domestic level and that was the idea of the of the Human Rights Act in the first place. Oh my goodness. So it's, 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 it's really so worrying in terms yeah. of where, not just what's happening in terms of people's lives, but where it's setting us up for the next political fight and the next ideological battle or foe sort of argument at, 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 a, at a European level. Um, but the the impact on the ground is that pe- people's access to, to to rights will be fundamentally just, reduced. Yeah. I mean, it impacts on so many levels. It, even oh. even just even just at a at a good Friday agreement yeah. level, you know, there was the commitment to to incorporate the convention rights. Um, and, but it wasn't just that. It was it was a commitment of access to the convention that the assembly would act compatibly with it, and that there would be remedies for breach of the convention available mm-hmm. to individuals. Now, what the current government will tell us is that well, we're going to replicate the convention rights, um, and they'll still be there. And, and that will mean that they're still and that will compliant mi- with the Good Friday Agreement. In their in, in their, their eyes, in their but, eyes, yeah, yeah okay. they, they they think that. But if you fundamentally alter how the convention rights have been accessible, you know, the, the level of protection enjoyed mm-hmm. under the convention uh, since 2002 and then you fundamentally alter people's access yeah. to the rights plus they're also introducing um, a, a new permission stage 
whereby they have to, the person has to show or evidence serious disadvantage before the a case can proceed um, under the Human Rights Act. Now, that is a measure that will limit people's access to the okay. courts and to those, vi- those remedies as outlined, not only in, in, in the Convention, but in the Good Friday Agreement as well. So uh, the UK government are on a trajectory where they will, you know, they'll say they're going to incorporate the Convention rights, but in terms of compliance with the Good Friday Agreement, they'll be completely at odds with it. Oh. So obviously huge implications for Northern Ireland. But with this, because it's UK wide and it's going to impact everybody, do you liaise with your colleagues or counterparts across the UK on this? Because it seems to me to be so overwhelmingly important and fundamental to all of us. Absolutely. How does that work? Yeah, it's it's such an, a, a, a horrible mm. piece of legislation. It really is. And it it, it it has the potential to violate so many people's rights and remove access to rights that there is a, what I can only call a mass mobilisation across mm. the UK at a civil society level to resist this, this piece of legislation. Um, in terms of process, what has happened, it was it was shelved in September when Liz Truss became Prime Minister and Dominic Raab exited the scene as, no, as just a secretary. <laughs> but now he's back. Oh my God, how do you um, keep up? You must be watching the news. Oh, damn it. Yeah, he's back again. <laughs> I think there was, a, there was a collective sigh of relief in September, but I think yeah. everybody felt that, well, it was just... It, It'll be it, someone else. It, was a, it would yeah. be someone else. Else. Yeah. And and I think uh, it gave t- Paul time for Paul's reflection and maybe circle the wagons a sure. wee bit. But um, we did expect this to come back, and obviously a very short turnaround. Dominic mm. Rab is back in as just a secretary Great, in yeah. recent weeks, and has already said that he's going to reintroduce the the bill. He's going to go full um, throttle. And, and and unfortunately, that looks like it, that's what will happen. Yeah, and uh, this rights removal bill. Um, we, we had thought it would already be introduced. It might be introduced before recess oh, uh, yeah. in December, but if not, we'd say early in, early in January. But I, I have to admit, it's because the bill is so bad um, mm-hmm. that it, it's been it's been easier to mobilise people across the UK. And not only do yeah, you have okay. not yeah. only do you have your big hitters like Liberty and Amnesty and sure. Justice BAHR, you have lots and lots of smaller organisations. Who you know the the impact might be on only in one area of law, but they're really really concerned about it. And I think particularly the removal of that idea of positive obligations mm. on, on 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 public authorities to take preemptive action mm-hmm. to 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 protect rights. So it's not about just setting back. It's about well, how do we go out yeah. and proactively introduce measures that will protect people's rights? The removal of that uh, those protections in particular has mobilised a lot of civil society organisations across the UK. UK. So the Save Our Human Rights Act coalition was set up, um, I think, back in June, July, and it already has, I think, about 360 uh, civil society organisations involved. Um, we also have our own sort of working group in Northern Ireland of, of organisations trying to sort of articulate Northern Ireland specific arguments, sure. particularly around the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process mm-hmm. here. But, it, uh, you know, it's, it's I suppose it's a case of all hands on deck because there is yeah. a crisis. It, it almost would have been harder if there had been just one element yeah. of the bill that they were Not attacking. Not as many would have gotten behind it as such, but as you say, mass mobilisation well, is probably you know necessary and maybe not as hard to kind of rally, given that it impacts so many organisations and individuals, all of us, all of us. So that's it. And I think know. our fear in the in the interim was that they might, particularly with the Suella Braverman coming in as, as Home Secretary, was that they might just pick out one or two mm-hmm. issues or, or rights, particularly articulate at the right to privacy yeah. and family life. Um, because one of the things they're also trying to do is limit the use of Article 8, uh, Article 8 usage in deportation cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's that's really a case of well, let's pick an unpopular group uh, and target yeah. them. Easy, um, easy uh, done. Uh, sort of, I think they see that as the sort of low hanging fruit yeah. in terms of the Human Rights Act, and it's it's very much the sort of dog whistle politics reaction to what they're reading in some of the tabloid papers around um, immigration and asylum seekers. And it's really, in terms of human rights, it makes a mockery of the concept of universality of human rights. I mean, uh, they're just creating an absolute mess for themselves anyway in terms of the challenges. That, like, where does it get them to yeah, do that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, effort. the idea that they'll take one of the articles in the convention and apply it differently to a different group, yeah. you know, is already a violation already, of the convention yeah, yeah, yeah. itself in terms of discrimination. No. But it, it, it just, it, it's racist in its yeah, application, you know, it and, and, and as a concept as far as we're concerned. But a good one for, you know, a good, um, as you said, low-hanging fruit, scapegoats, always um, immigration, um, vulnerable people as well to try it out on. But I can just see that just blowing up 
Uh, yeah, and I th- and I think our fear was that they would just come back with mm. a with a, and they may still do this with a version of that um, rights removal bill that yeah. just targeted you know one or two things where they feel they might get more support. Yeah. Um, but I I, th- I think you know um, the degree of resistance that has been built up to this and the sort of the trajectory that they've already Good. put us on, yeah. um, you know, is is, is unstoppable. Um, yeah. Hopefully, and that I think there will be a, a strong degree of advocacy against Good. this, and hopefully, public yeah. support as well, which is Absolutely. really, really important. Absolutely, um, and thankfully, we've organisations like yourselves and your members, you know, to represent all of us on that on that level. And just in terms of that, how does the impact of our current government situation here, um, you know, was that a worry for you as an organisation to see what happened, you know, over the last few weeks, um, in terms of Stormont? I, I think it's worrying just on multiple levels. Mm. Um, you know, obviously you have the cost of living crisis in terms of just ma- making day-to-day decisions mm-hmm. as regards um, expenditure and, and debt and even the application of those funds that are coming sure. through at a UK level. Um, you have the negotiations around the protocol um, mm-hmm. and the future of that and obviously having sort of you know, their voices feeding into that would be, mm-hmm. would be helpful. Um, but some of the division at the minute is quite... It's it's quite unhelpful in terms of the the politics that's going on in terms of community division. You know, th- folks are saying that you know even in our membership that sort of some of the spaces that used to be there for sort of peace building and sort of conversations is is rapidly decreasing okay. because of some of the some of the division that's been created yeah. around the protocol. It's unhelpfully, I think, yeah. yeah. Um, and then at a, at a UK level, I think when it comes to you know the the pro the protocol bill, the legacy bill. Uh, the human right the thre- attempts to remove the Human Rights Act. The lack of that executive voice, um, the lack of uh, a voice in the Assembly to resist some of these measures is re- really, really telling. Um, we had a conference a couple of weeks ago where we had um, a Scot- the Scottish Justice Minister and the Welsh um, Social Justice Minister speaking. Uh, we had Naomi Long, yeah. but she was no longer a minister. Okay. Um, now, obviously, she's a great supporter of the Human Rights Act. It was great having her there, but she wasn't a minister. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise, the Scottish and the Welsh executive have formally come out to um, say that they reject the bill. They've all, all already rejected uh, a motion, uh, a Sewell Convention uh, motion in the in the Welsh Senate. Um, you know, we haven't because we don't have an assembly. We can't even be asked, um, and we haven't an executive to take a decision around it. Um, and that's in a situation where, as regards the Human Rights Act, you know, it's not, you can't al- always assume that, you know, th- th- there will be division around yeah. this. There's potentially, given the the centrality of the Human Rights Act to the Good Friday Agreement, that we might get a consensus in our executive that actually don't touch it, leave it alone. Right. You know, we've had MPs like Jim Shannon stand up in the House mm-hmm. of Commons and say, you know, listen, this is, this is a really important piece of legislation that doesn't need changed. If anything, okay. we need rights added to it. So, you know, it's, I don't think we should assume that if yeah, the executive yeah, was okay. there, they wouldn't be able to agree as as fond as mm. they are of disagreeing i think potentially um given the size of this piece of legislation the importance might it might agreement. be that they, mm-hmm. there might be agreement but if we don't have that executive in place i suppose that's some that's one of the gaps that we see that there is no one to stand up for northern ireland at that, at that yeah. sort of government level and say no not in our name type mm-hmm. thing you know mm-hmm. gosh and just in terms of strategizing and planning ahead um how does it work for your organization now i mean the future seems to have been uncertain it's since as far as I can so remember, long, yeah, <laughs> I yeah, just can't yeah. remember having any certainty in in the last while anyway. But it must be difficult to plan ahead. Um, but how how do you do it? Because you you do have a huge membership. You have to consider so many factors, mm. um, not alone the political um, pressure at the time, whoever that might be in power. What's next, and you know how do you figure all of that out in terms of your ultimate objectives? I, th- I think the big problem, as you said, is that things are so tenuous at the minute mm. that they're they're so um, uh, existing standards are, are under threat that mm. we need to respond mm-hmm. to that threat. But then that has an impact on other resources and other capacities. For for us, I suppose you know we want to be forward facing. We yeah, want sure. to be looking at well, where are the gaps in work, and we fill the additional rights and and, and on what does that look like, and that you know, goes back to our work on on the Bill of Rights. Um, and I think members, our members particularly in civil society, that's where they want to see um, things moving as well. I think COVID and the cost of living crisis has really crystallised 
um, in people's minds the fact that you know old traditional sort of worn out arguments about you know the cost of you know additional yeah. rights or we can't afford to you know implement sort of you know even things around destitution uh-huh. or homelessness or housing well the pandemic clearly showed that actually that's not true you can do yeah. where there's a will there's a way Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and old sort of notions around social and economic rights you know um, you know you can't take away the power of elected representatives to make you know decisions around yeah. finite resources well it's not about that mm-hmm. it's actually about setting a direction of travel and then you guys sure. go off and see how we get yeah. there it's about setting those sort of minimum core obligations in place you know we have all sorts of you know analysis in Northern Ireland that talks about health inequalities and mental health inequalities and different equalities in yeah. terms of services but when it comes to solutions they're never framed as right solutions they're never framed as well actually what we need to do is establish mm-hmm. a right to an adequate standard of physical and mental health and look at the UN standards and bring it into Northern Ireland see how we can develop a healthcare service and pathways around public public services that are human rights compliant and that's all people are asking for it's yeah. about having human rights compliant decision making sure. and while there are really good measures that are taken by individual ministers and individual departments and no one would knock that it's the level of inconsistency mm-hmm. It's the lack of sort of knowing that, well, we can count on those public authorities to make a sort of human rights compliant, go, almost go through a checklist. And I think it's particularly evident when we don't have an executive or an assembly in place that where, where does the buck stop and what are the go? standards yeah. that we're working towards? Absolutely. It's almost like we're sort of running around like headless chickens in terms of our human rights priorities. Mm. And that if we had that level of accountability uh, you know, built into a, something like a Bill of Rights, it would help. But I, I think it's also that we look to, you know, the rest of the UK. And in 1988, we were leading the way. We had Section 75 with the cons- with the convention. Mm. We, had the, we had the prospect of our own Bill of Rights. And now flash forward to 2022, and we're the poor cousin of yeah. the United Kingdom wow. because yeah. Wales, uh, Wales, Scotland and England have the Equality Act 2010, which updated equality, or brought them all together, have measures that, that isn't included in our equality protections. Wales and Scotland have uh, marched forward in terms of incorporating international standards like the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in domestic law. Um, and, our, and Scotland is looking to go further and have a broader uh, mm-hmm. rights bill that will incorporate the ICESC on mm-hmm. economic social rights. Yet in Northern Ireland, we're still stuck in, in, in the idea of w- whether we'll have a Bill of Rights mm-hmm. or not. Um, and yeah, as I said, we've turned a page. We have majority political support for that, but we're still being resisted with this yeah. old chestnut of, well, no, we need uh, political consensus. And across the parties. So, well. so it's, it's really, I suppose for us, we would like to sort of follow mm-hmm. suit and look at that Scottish and Welsh model and see, well, if they're not going to give us a Bill of Rights, you know, w- c- you know, can we, at least, Can we adopt the yeah. UNCRC yeah. or UNCRPD into domestic mm-hmm. law? It won't go as far as the Bill of Rights because, you know, uh, the Bill of Rights was to be Westminster legislation and bind Westminster uh, in terms of what it does in Northern okay. Ireland to be compatible with those international standards, whereas but a domestic piece yeah. of legislation would only d- us, bind yeah. the, mm-hmm. the Assembly. So there's a difference. But if they're saying... You know, no, no bill of rights. Well, in the interim, give us give those. Us d- yeah. You know, there's, there's, there should be no barrier to, to adopting it. So I think that is the challenge for our elected representatives now. Okay. Um, to, to you know, to not only obviously, if we get the assembly restored, there is an option to do that. In the interim, while we're bill, hoping yeah. to develop a, a broader, broader bill of rights. But it doesn't help if the floor is being cut out uh, from under us in terms of the convention rights uh, and some of the protocol protections that we thought were the, were the, were the basis for moving onwards. Because clearly um, the direction of travel is, is backwards rather than forwards. Gosh, oh my goodness, it's just so overwhelming, isn't it? And startling just to, to hear where we're at, even in the context of, of the other um, devolved governments as well. Yeah, so another uh, so area of our work that we try to, to focus on with our members is the UK's obligations under international standards. So mm-hmm. um, every member state of the United Nations uh, signs up to a range or has the option of signing up to a range of um, what are effectively human rights treaties. Okay. So there are a range of covenants, uh, I mentioned some of them already, but they range from uh, issue-specific areas like p- persons with disabilities, um, discrimination against women, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, right up to sort of uh, covenants dealing with economic and social rights and civil and political rights. Um, these treaties are, are really important, I suppose, because they sort of set the standard and set the bar internationally for the type of rights that most societies sort of should aspire to um, adopting okay. within their within their laws domestically. Um, some of the some of the rights, the civil and political rights, like ICCPR. 
Um, many of the provisions of that treaty will already be adopted into uh, domestic law in the UK mm-hmm. via um, the Human Rights Act that we, we've been talking about. Um, but there are other provisions, um, in, in fact, most of the other treaties that aren't adopted into mm-hmm. into domestic law. And the UK is in a in a in a in a, in a particular situation where it has a dualist um, system of 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 incorporation, whereby it can sign up to a treaty. Um, but it doesn't have domestic effect in its in its in its in its domestic law unless it has it's specifically adopted in a separate piece of legislation okay. through Westminster. Other countries have a mono, mono systems whereby if they sign up to a treaty on an international level, it's automatically accessible in their courts uh, to to its citizens. The difficulty then that this leaves us in is that you know we clearly then have gaps in our rights in terms of what the ideal is and what sure. the current situation is on the ground. Um, a long running. Cal- Campaign for us has been obviously the Bill of Rights, and we'd feel that uh, the, the gaps in terms of the Bill of Rights that it could fill are those suite of international standards. Um, and in in lieu of uh, being able to realise or accept, access those rights um, via domestic legislation, one way in which um, the UK can be held to account for its performance under those treaties, because it has a political obligation to the UN to realise, to give effect to those treaties, those treaty provisions in in its domestic uh, jurisdiction. And one of the ways it can be held to account is by what's called a treaty monitoring process at the UN. So this is, I suppose, it's a cyclical process whereby every four to five years the UK is reviewed for its performance under each of those covenants. And what happens is the the state party is supposed to consult with civil society and the public around um, what has happened, how are these rights being realised, what can they do better. They then draft a state party report and submit it to the UN. The UN uh, has a committee for each of the treaties. It it draws together three or four of those individuals in a pre-sessional working group. Um, Those individuals come up with a list of questions and they do so uh, informed by um, shadow reports or parallel reports that are submitted by civil society. Um, and that's often where we come in. Okay. Um, yeah. We do training with civil society organisations around that process, around working in the UN and submitting to the UN and drafting those uh, parallel reports. And those really are sort of uh, pieces of policy, pieces of evidence that we submit to the UN to actually give them the full picture of what's mm-hmm. happening on the ground. Because what we've found, we, we don't even get access to what they write about Northern Ireland. We we see the amalgamated uh, U- UK <laughs> version, the sort of the sanitised version. Um, and what often, it, it's what isn't there that is the problem. Yeah. It's it's quite a sort of positive picture, obviously, that the, the state part of the UK are trying to paint. But they miss out huge swathes of, of issues mm-hmm. and, and areas around human rights. Our job as civil society organisations, and it's not just the consortium, it's our members yeah. um, who, are, who are, you know, some of them are experts in particular treaties, who feed into that process and sure. who update the UN, who go and meet the UN, who brief them verbally or in, in written format about what the situation is in the ground. And then there's an opportunity for the, in terms of the process, there's an opportunity for the UK to come back and rebut or provide additional evidence. And when they do so, we can provide an updated report. And then there's the there's the sort of the pinnacle where there's the the review, which yeah. is a session in person where the UK civil servants go and are questioned by that council or by that committee, ask questions, ask provide evidence, or where's the lack lack of evidence in in many cases. And then there's a series of recommendations that are put uh, in a, in what's called concluding observations that come out of that committee a, a, a couple of weeks after. And it's really those concluding observations where civil society are trying to get recommendations to, to, to for the state party, yeah. t- for the UK, to say, you know, you need to do the X or Y, or you need to perform better in terms of meeting this, this rights obligations. Northern Ireland civil society have really batted above its weight and uh, the whole sort of his, throughout the whole history of these this sort of treaty review process mm-hmm. um, we've had recommendations around um, abortion legislation around housing around the Bill of Rights mm-hmm. around the Human Rights Act around the legacy issues yeah. around disabled persons access you know, all the whole spectrum of rights mm-hmm. issues Northern Ireland has been reflected in there and um, I suppose to, to, to many degrees you know, sometimes the UK ignores those recommendations. It doesn't yeah. do anything. Impact, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, I, what I always say about this process is 
don't go into it thinking it's going to be a magic bullet um, for mm. anybody. It is it is one tool in a sort of suite of advocacy tools that you sure. can use as a civil society organisation. But the really important thing is it's the soft political sort of moral weight and authority of the UN saying to the UK, here's your report card. You're doing okay in this, but you could really do an awful lot better here. And this is where you're not protecting. And in your experience, have you seen, I mean... Uh, the UK like do not like being embarrassed on the international stage. They do not like being told by other countries... Um, um, you're doing you're doing badly, and 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 I, and I suppose it's that it's that sort of moral authority and power to us to be able to say, listen, the UN are saying you need to do mm. this, you need to incorporate these really protections, or you haven't done enough. Um, what are you going to do about it? Mm-hmm. And yes, they can choose to ignore it and 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 and, and not act on some measures. Some of them they do. But um, I think for us, for civil society, it lends sort of political and more weight to the arguments that you're making at a domestic uh, level. Yeah. So it's just yeah. another sort of set of, of recommendations. You also in that sort of, um, there's also special um, special measures um, as part of the UN system as well, whereby they have thing called special rapporteurs who mm-hmm. come and who have like either country-specific mandates or have issue-specific mandates. So we had Philip Alston, who was the special rapporteur on uh, the uh, on extreme poverty, okay. um, came to the UK in 2019. We hosted him in Belfast, right. took him around, met trade unions, met uh, law centres, folks that worked on social security, yeah. um, all the sort of uh, housing in North Belfast, all the organisations that really uh, are fo- were focused on poverty um, at, the, at, the, at the time from a rights perspective. Mm. And his review of the UK was scathing, mm. absolutely scathing in terms of the, tra- the trajectory of the social security system since 2010, things like the two-child rule, the mm-hmm. sort of limitation on universal credit. Um, all of those things had really just put so many people, forced so many people into poverty. Yeah. Um, and the, the, I suppose the big impact of it was the sort of media impact because you had sort of, you know, more uh, some of the more right wing sort of press coming out and saying, oh, how dare this sort of foreign person come and tell us um, that we don't have a good human rights record. Um, You had other sort of uh, media outlets sort of analysing the details and sort of showing the the report. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the big value of it was that it was that it shone a light um, on on the issue at the time and continue uh, th- those type of interventions continue to shine light at periodic moments on uh, the, the reality on the ground mm-hmm. as regards human rights uh, different human rights issues so again it's that it's that sort of soft power of the yeah. sort of either media or international attention on the issue at, at, on, at, on any helps. issue at a given time it all sure. helps um, and while there's a the the current trajectory of the UK government is not good as I'm regards just thinking, human rights, well, what's the yeah. light going to be like over it, the next couple of yeah, years? It's going to be it's going to be pretty gonna be pretty, pretty bad. But we also we also have then the you know that's the UN system. You have the Council of Europe, mm. um, and in terms of some of the commentary, so we had uh, the the Human Rights Commission of the Council of Europe visited us here early in the year. Um, they have the Committee of Ministers as well, who current, uh, periodically comment on some of the legacy cases, mm. and and. Uh, they have been invaluable in really saying in terms of the Council of Europe's position and in terms of human rights, you're seriously in jeopardy of being in violation of the Convention because of the Legacy yeah. Bill and the, the, the Rights Removal Bill to, to undermine the Human Rights Act. Now, the Council of Europe is important because um, what country has just been expelled from the Council of Europe? Russia, because of what it's done in the Ukraine. So if the Council of Europe are saying you have a bad human rights record um, and they've expelled Russia, then it doesn't look good for the UK. It does not. So I, I think... I think those points of political sort of international pressure yeah. help. You know, they're not they're not a solution in the in yeah. and of themselves, but they help in terms they of advocacy. And I think it's why it's important that the civil society uh, get involved and have yeah. their voices heard. So there's the UK has just been reviewed under the Universal Periodic Review. So that's a slightly different system where all member states themselves ask questions on now, a particular issue or across all, the board across okay. all the human rights issues and the Universal Declaration uh, okay. and all the commitments. Mm-hmm. Now it's it tends to be slightly more sort of like hands off and mm-hmm. m- more polite because they don't sort of critique as much. Sure. Um, but there are recommendations, I think, you know, over a third of the recommendations to the UK in November when this happened were around the Human Rights Act. It was like, what do you do on the Human Rights Act? You uphold the convention, right? Please make sure there's no diminution of rights, yeah. all of that. So it was very, very important in that co- sense. Um and now coming into the new year in 2023, we're go- the UK is going to be reviewed under the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Okay. So everything from housing, food, education, um, health, 
all of the, the right to work, all of those issues are going to be reviewed. And in a cost of living crisis and where strikes are happening in England and nurses are going on strikes, a waiting right. list in hospitals at the minute, it's really, really important that civil society voices are heard because yeah. the, the, the information that they'll get from the UK government will not be the complete picture. No. So um, anybody that wants to um, submit and become involved in that process, they can actually go to our website and find right. out a wee bit more about it. And we do a bit of training around that as oh. well. And the deadline for making a submission is in early January. Although they'll get a hopefully get a second bite at the ch- cherry yeah, they, they later in the do. year as well. And would that be organisations or individuals? Usually organisations, but organisations can all can all can pull together as well. If yeah, they don't yeah. have capacity themselves, okay. they can pull together. And actually, the UN recommend that groups come together and do mm. it on a joint basis. That's great to see how that works in practice because mm. I mean I've been party to our reviewed reports and recommendations before, but you never quite yeah. understand. Maybe that's on one particular matter, but collectively how it can be impactful. And you've just given examples of that. So that's that's great and a, a huge part of your work, I'd imagine. It's 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 a sort of it it has. Um, Peaks and troughs because mm. it comes because that cyclical goes. process yeah, yeah. it comes and goes and but I suppose the challenge is really keeping the pressure mm-hmm. in the interim sort of three or four years to keep the pressure on public authorities to say well what are you doing about that yeah. recommendation you know yeah. and thankfully though it's spaced out over time Good. some organisations will be some bus- busier at different times yeah, compared to others on depending on when the, the when the reviews are mm. interesting. But just um, anyone listening to this, I mean, will surely, you know, agree that the, the work that you're doing, your organisation are doing and all of other members and other um, lobbyist organisations is fundamental and crucial. Um, and that idea of mass mobilisation is obviously necessary, you know, to challenge this. But you also celebrate human rights as well as part of you know, your work. And I think we're it's very timely that you have the Northern Ireland Human Rights Festival coming up that you're very much involved in. Do you want to tell us a wee bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the Human Rights Festival it, you know, it actually started when I was in Bosnia. The idea, um, right? Yeah, we were we were looking for a way to to bring sort of different community groups and different organisations together to celebrate yeah. uh, Human Rights Day, which is, falls on the the tenth of December every year, which is the day in which the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in nineteen forty eight. Um, and uh, when we were, uh, when I was in Bosnia, we were looking for a way to sort of bring groups together to do that. Mm. So we brought a group of you know different cultural yeah. sort of civic society organisations together on Human Rights Day, and everybody did a bit you know and talked about their issue or you know cultural different cultural backgrounds, and it was a great gathering. And then I, I I came back home and traditionally on the 10th of December we had all been scrambling to do something or hold an event or okay. have a talk <laughs> and it, it, everybody was trying to do it in the same day which meant yeah. sometimes nobody got to anything and mm-hmm. or it was overlapping yeah, and it was sure. a bit co- so we just thought well listen what are we trying to do a bit of coordination around this and mm-hmm. maybe sort of have a, a facilitated day or a couple of days mm-hmm. and our members and civil society generally just really bought into the concept and it started off as two days I think we went with a space upstairs in the Ulster mm-hmm. Hall and and that was it. And then it has grown really into yeah. a week long series of events, um, which is really, uh, I suppose, a hybrid mix of your traditional sort of talks and lectures about human rights, but also integrated with like artistic and creative events and the sort of best of like talent from Northern Ireland and beyond in terms of just sharing different cultural, you know, international. Mm-hmm local perspectives on mm. you know, social justice issues or rights yeah. issues or you know lots of organizations don't even frame them as rights issues for mm. us when we look at them they're rights issues but for them they're just issues or concerns they're working on that they've interpreted through some sort of art medium but they fit absolutely really Good. really well yeah. in the festival and a great way for us of, 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 of sort of talking about human rights without going into the boring language of article this or article that and I suppose that was the other idea behind the festival. So it was, it was about coordination on the, on the day, but on the week, but but also about how we create new audiences and bring new people into conversations about human rights. Because unfortunately, here, given our history, a lot of the conversation when it comes to right, it's orange and green politics, yeah. and it and it gets stuck in that sort mm-hmm. of quagmire, and it doesn't move beyond it. Certainly, at a sort of media level or traditional media level, at least. Um, and we wanted to sort of try and bring new audiences into into converse. So one of the 
folks involved at one stage tr- described the festival as a gateway drug to human rights. But <laughs> I would, <laughs> wouldn't necessarily use that phrase myself, but it's sort of, it's evocative of, 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 of a, a evocative description yeah, yeah. to try and that idea of just being a gateway to conversations about rights um, and about bringing different uh, different audiences and new audiences into, 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 into the room. Mm-hmm. And that has really worked. Um, it's sort of, it, it you know, it, so, uh, there's always something for for, mm-hmm. for 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 anybody who, no matter who you are, what your what yeah. your taste. And you open are. it up to every uh, like it's lots a, of people can. It's submit. a public. It's yeah. totally. You don't get an event in the festival yeah, unless yeah. it's open to the public. You can't yeah, yeah. have closed it's events. Great. It's totally open to the public. Um, a lot of it, obviously, because of lockdown now, has been online. But this year we're starting to open back are up. You? And, yeah, okay. there's a sort of a mixture of online yeah, and in person events, which is great to see. It's more accessible. Yeah. Than to just have that hybrid approach. The, the, the hybrid really helped mm-hmm. with accessibility. It also really opened up the audience across Northern Ireland as well yeah. and beyond. Because what we saw before that was it was largely Belfast based the in person events some events in Uri, Derry, places like that but largely Belfast but when you go on online you, you're mm. drawing audience and participants from, from, from across everywhere, from, across from even North, outside yeah. I'd say as well people Absolutely, are interested yeah. in human rights here you know um, we have some really good highlights uh, in the festival so we've a, we've a group of uh, Palestinian NGOs who were shut down in the summer by the Israeli authorities doing a really interesting talk about their experiences as human rights okay. advocates in, in Palestine um, happening during the week um, we have a debate around the uh, conversation around the Human Rights Act with that Save Our Human Rights Tune Act in coalition. Everybody. You'll already be well briefed <laughs> on it. <laughs> Next week as well, we have a conversation around where rights sit in the conversation around constitutional change in Northern okay. Ireland. Um, so we've been joined by some academics at Queen's and some NGOs from uh, from Dublin and from, from Belfast in a conversation about that. We have a family day on the Saturday the 10th of December in the Black Box, um, okay. which is which is always great fun for yeah. kids. So so come along um, and then we have Disability Action doing a range of sort of disabled mm-hmm. persons or focused organi- uh, artistic events um, online uh, on, on the 3rd of December and 3rd of December is International Day of Persons with Disability so we've That's right, yeah. purposely P- coordinated perfect. to run from the 3rd to the 10th of December so it mm-hmm. starts on the 3rd and finishes since so we can include Excellent. that so Disability Action are doing a whole range of events on the 3rd so it's great Amazing and you have a dedicated website I believe Yeah to, dedicated to website uh, NIHRF dot com mm-hmm. um, so folks can go and visit that and I think everything oh, well if, yeah. if everything's not up there at the minute there'll, there'll be everything will be added to and then in, in, over the next day and some folks are still coming in with Good. events to give it to it so there's a there's a there's a bit of something for yeah. everybody there hopefully because last year I think it was all o- online wasn't it it was all online yeah. it was all online yeah. the year before or was it the year before because, because of COVID but yeah. um, right that's really interesting so definitely check that out um, I had looked at it but again just to have a proper wee look to see what, what's there in the family day sounds really interesting as well for anyone with, with kids bring them along and get yeah. them interested and even for kids if you can't get along there's pre-recorded mm. stuff that like there's story time stories about human rights pre-recorded oh, by wow. actually by really some, yeah by some of our human rights commissioners oh, who recorded brilliant. it yeah there's also like coloring in things about human rights yeah. you can download and so there's lots for kids right. as well we try and sort of have the family day and that on-demand section particularly for kids as well love that that's fantastic wow well like lots going on there um, and in your work in general but just finally to tie everything up and i feel like this is a bit of a foolish question to ask you given everything that you've just discussed but activism we're all about obviously the law um, and activist lawyers here who you know that it ties in the theme of this podcast really does tie into what you've just discussed in terms of the attacks on the legal profe- profession tied up into this whole diminution of rights and the human rights act etc cetera, etc cetera. but just broadly I mean, how important is it to, and we'll say mobilise, how important is it to to get involved and really stand up and, you know, become active within society, not just in organisations, but in public? I I think it's... I think it's really important. I think, you know, sometimes it's easy to assume that someone else is standing up mm-hmm. or someone else is involved in conversations that are important. Um, I, I think it's also, there's also danger at the minute that some of the... Some of the reactions that we're seeing to, you know, campaigns for equality or equal treatment are being dismissed yeah. or being sidelined as, you know, either wokeism or some mm. sort of liberal or lefty campaign. There, I'd love someone to define for me what they mean by wokeism. If they mean, if they mean people not taking discrimination anymore, if they mean um, people standing up against inequalities, mm. then 
you know, why not just say that? Yeah. That I think there's a there's a dismissal also almost of people um, trying to trying to claim and vindicate in, individual rights, and and by that just uphold their basic dignity as a human human sure. being. I, I worry about the, the trajectory of some of that narrative um, mm. and where it's taking us. So I think instead of you know, you know, the, I think I, I, I hate to criticize social media, mm. but I think a lot of it is driven by folks who are keyboard warriors and, and feeling that they need to comment and everything and critique mm -hmm. folks that are involved in some of these campaigns. Yeah. I, I put a challenge to people, put your money where your mouth is and get out and get involved in some of the groups that are actively trying to make people's lives better on the ground um, and then critique it. Um, I think the power of activism I is amazing. I think change only happens when people come together and work together and drive forward for change that that, that, w that is needed. I think it's, 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 it's too easy, I think, here in an any society to assume that oh if we had the right politicians or if we had the right political party in power that things will change that's i think that's a bit of a cop out i think we actually need active citizens and people involved mm -hmm. in, in 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 making the running and putting it up to politicians and in and in advocating for change and linked to that i think politics can only achieve so much yeah. i think the law and legislation that's where the, the overlap between activism and law is really important for me that, you know, commitments by a political party will only take us so far. But having a specific rights commitment, having a piece of legislation that will be upheld in courts, that will be um, adhered to by public authorities, that judges will be able to stand over and administer as part of the rule of law, that's where... Um, rights need to go. Mm -hmm. They need to be on that permanent footing because a right it doesn't exist unless you can realise it, unless you can tangibly uh, hold people to account for a violation yeah. of that right in, in, in the courts. So, you know, we can't talk about rights in the abstract. They have mm -hmm. to be given practical expression through legislation. And that's why some of these campaigns not just defending the Human Rights Act really important, but adding to those rights and adding to the, the sort of suite uh, and the complex suite, yes, but the suite of, of protections that we have in law, and that's that's really really important. The more people we have involved in that campaigning, the better, and it it would it could only um, benefit from from additional organisations and individuals and getting individuals. involved. Absolutely. Well, look, that has been just truly insightful, informative, but really important, that discussion today. So thank you so, thank so much for, for coming in, really Kevin. Not at all. And um, we will share links to the um, festival as well. And we'd ask everybody to check that out. And obviously the fantastic work of your organisation as well. We really appreciate it. Thank you very doing. much. Appreciate no problem. It. Thank Thanks, you. Kevin. Bye. This podcast was recorded in Granite Podcast Studio. Interested in starting up your own podcast but don't know how? Granite Podcast Studio can help. Record your podcast in our state-of-the-art studio, which is based in the heart of Newry City. Our studio has cutting-edge and user-friendly technology and can seat up to four people. We also provide an editing service for our team using your guidance and editing notes to provide you with a flawless finished product, leaving your listeners wanting more. For more information on how you can get started, visit www.granitepodcaststudio.com.